A long time ago, we had no idea what the atom looked like. We've come a long way in the past couple hundred years. Each step of the way, we learned a little bit more. A lot of science is a scientist making a discovery and another scientist building on top of that, another scientist building on top of that, and so on and so forth. That's how science works. One builds off the other. So it's no surprise that atomic theory has worked out the same way. Now remember, in science, a theory is something that we have been able to prove. It's a how something happened. Even though we know atoms exist, it's still called atomic theory. It's taken a long time to come to what we know today about atomic theory. It started with a guy named Democritus, who's a pupil of Leucippus around 400 BC. Um, he didn't really do experiments, he just thought about it. Back then, a lot of science was just philosophy, but he coined the term atomos, meaning indivisible. He basically thought that if you cut something in half enough times, eventually you get to a point where you can't cut it in half anymore, and that was an indivisible little part. He thought it would be just like the big thing that you were cutting apart, so clay atoms would be like tiny, tiny pieces of clay, and iron atoms would be tiny pieces of iron, maybe metal. Many, many, many years later, a guy named John Dalton came along, and he actually did experiments. John Dalton thought that atoms were like tiny billiard balls. He thought they were indivisible spheres. Figured that all matter was made of atoms. All atoms of an element are the same, and atoms of different elements have different properties. He used experiments to figure out that reactions happen in specific ratios. So. You can see that here he figured oxygen was 16 mass units, and it combined with two mass units of hydrogen, one mass unit each. They made a total of 18 mass units. Quite a while later, a guy named J.J. Thompson came along. He used cathode ray tubes and magnets to figure out there were negatively charged particles in the atom. He called it the plum pudding model. You may be familiar with cathode ray tubes. They're long tubes of gas with an electric charge going through them. You may have seen them before, perhaps in your classroom. Perhaps if you look up, you might find some version of a cathode ray tube. Science. Thinking of magnets, how like charges repel and opposites attract, he was able to discover with these bent cathode ray tubes that there was something negative in the atom. He also discovered it was very small. He knew the overall charge of the atom was neutral, so he figured electrons were like little tiny pieces scattered throughout some kind of positively charged matrix. He was British, so he thought of this as kind of a plum pudding. So the little bit, the little electrons were like little bits of fruit, and the cake or pudding itself was the positive matrix. You can think of it kind of like a fruit cake. Plum pudding was a common British dessert at the time. I'm an American, don't come for me. So I like to think of it like a chocolate chip cookie. Here is some chocolate chip cookie dough. In the Thompson model, he thought of elections as these little chocolate chips, little bits scattered throughout, and the dough would be a positive matrix. So he thought the atom was something positive with negative bits in there that, that made the overall thing neutral. So we would think of the chocolate chips as the negative electrons, and then the dough as some kind of positive matrix, or something positive to hold it all together. Okay, off. Not too long later, a guy named Ernest Rutherford did what's called the gold foil experiment. What he did is he had a lead block containing radioactive substance that, that emitted alpha particles, which they didn't realize were bad for you at the time, and they shot it at a piece of gold foil. They figured that if the Blum Pudding model was correct, it would either go straight through or they'd be deflected slightly. Well, and that happened to most of them, but some of the alpha particles bounced either stri almost straight back or at strong angles. So through doing this experiment, they were able to prove that there was a positively charged nucleus in the center of the atom. Here's a way you can model the Rutherford experiment. What I have here is a board, and I can't see it, but it has a little styrofoam piece on the other side. So I surrounded it by sand, and I have a piece of paper on top. So I'm going to take a little ruler and a marble and roll it down. Now, because of the grooves in the sand, I can mark where it came in and where it came out. So obviously it hit something. So I'm going to try that again in a different spot. It came out right here. I'm going to do little arrows. Arrow in, arrow out. So you can keep doing this until you figure out more about where this object is and the shape of it. So that went in right here and came out at an angle right here. So I'm kind of get I can kind of get an idea of where the object is in there. So this is similar to what Rutherford did because he couldn't see the nucleus of the atom. He just had to use data to figure out information about it. So I can kind of see where my thing is. Now let's try it a few different angles. So it's kind of giving me an idea. Obviously this isn't going to be perfect, but I'm going to keep trying. So I'm kind of getting an idea of the shape here. So 
so I know my nucleus is somewhere around here, but I'm not entirely sure of the shape yet. So I'll keep doing some experiments until I figure that out. And along the way, I should smooth this out. So you can do something like this at home. You don't have to have sand. You can use something else. Just something that would give you an idea of where something came in, where something came out. You can use carbon paper or dirt or whatever. My marble disappeared. Let's try that again. Okay, so I've made a lot of lines on here. It might be kind of hard to see for you people. But I've noticed that things are deflected this way. So I think I have something that's kind of at an angle here. So I'm thinking I have something like that. See, this one hits there, so I'm guessing kind of a rectangle-like thing. So this general shape. That's my guess. My guess is some kind of rectangular something based on the pattern. Hey, look, I was right. Not perfect, but right. You can do the same kind of thing at home where you try to make predictions about the size and shape of something underneath of a surface you can't see by hitting it with something else and seeing how that thing reacts. Niels Bohr worked with Rutherford and he figured out not only was there a positively charged nucleus, but that the electrons were in specific energy levels. This is usually the kind of model we use today, is the Bohr model. The Bohr model shows the positive nucleus of the protons, and now we know about neutrons, and that there are different energy levels. He called them orbitals. It's also called the planetary model because he thought of them as planets orbiting this, a star. James Chadwick later came along and discovered a neutron. He was looking at the data and figured out that the mass of a, of a lot of atoms was usually about twice as much as the number of protons. So he did a lot of tests with alpha particles and beryllium into paraffin wax, and he had a detector to count the protons, and he figured out there was a neutral particle in the nucleus of the atom, too. So since it was a neutral particle, it was named the neutron. Ah, <gasps> creative. Even though Chadwick is the one credited with discovering the neutron, we still use the term Bohr model when we're talking about the electron energy levels and we're talking about the simplified version. The Bohr model is what we generally use when, when we're drawing an atom because it's two-dimensional and easier to see. What we have now is the quantum model. It's been the work of a lot of scientists. So basically, just like Bohr discovered that electrons were in energy levels, we now know that they're not orbitals, they're in three-dimensional clouds of probability. So you have these little darker spots and the, the darker the spot, the more probable it is that the electron is there. And so you have one level, and then you have the, sec the next level, and then the next level, and then eventually you start getting little dumbbell shapes and see this one sticking out and this one sticking back. It all gets more and more complicated and crazy. So this is a little basic outline of what we know so far. So the billiard ball with Dalton, then we had the plum pudding model with Thompson, where the electrons were like little negative bits inside a positively charged matrix, kind of like chocolate chips. And then the Rutherford model, where we had a positive nucleus and the electrons around it. And then we had the Bohr model, where the electrons are in specific energy levels, although this isn't completely correct. You should have two here and up to eight here. But anyway, then the quantum model, which is as correct as we currently know. However, there still could be more that we don't know yet. A lot of times we'll use the Bohr model as a simplified version, just so we can understand it a little bit better. Atomic theory has come a long way in the past couple hundred years, and we still might not be all the way correct. But science is all about building on what other people have done and taking the next step. Science continues to progress, and we learn more and more things all the time. Maybe in a few decades we'll have a new model that we haven't even thought of yet, because we're always discovering more and more things. That is how it's spelled. Oh my goodness. Who would have thunk it? I can't point to them. <laughs> that something. Crap. Um, the Bohr, mo Bohr model is Bohr model. The Let's drop it on the floor. Stop it, you piece of garbage.